Hello, we're going to be using Morning Setting, Daily Prayer, page 295 in Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for this morning will be Psalm 83. O God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people, they plot against those who cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, and let the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind they plot together, they form an alliance against you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the people of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them to lend strength to the descendants of Lot. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera, to Yavin, and to at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor, became like refuse on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeev, and all their princes like Ziba and Zelmunna, who said, Let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, O my God, by a chaff before the wind. As fire consumes the forest, or a flame sets the mountains ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest, and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame, so that men will seek your name, O Lord. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the Most High over all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The text for meditation today is Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in, the, in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them away, uh, you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and end tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is the regular custom of the Passover. And even though I say custom, it is not simply something that you would customarily do, as you might customarily uh, take off your, your coat as you enter into somebody's house. No, this is uh, something that defines the people of Israel. The Passover is something that defines the people of Israel because it is deeply connected with the Exodus, with uh, God's deliverance from slavery, with God's deliverance into prosperity, into the Holy Land, into the Land of Promise. 
Uh, I'll be getting into those types of things in the next chapter. Uh, sorry, as I continue through this chapter, where you're supposed to be teaching this to your children and your children's children forever and ever, basically. Uh, this is what, and, and I will say, yes, this is something that really defines the people of Israel. Uh, because the Passover is that which saves them within the land of Israel, that they might not be victims of uh, God's vengeance, but that they might actually uh, participate in what God has given them in this lifetime so that they may, leave, uh, may, may live <laughs> in this world uh, with God's promise. So God tells, uh, tells the people, on this month, on this exact day, you are to bring a lamb into your household. Okay? Bring a lamb into your household on the tenth day of this month, uh, the first month of youth. So, uh, when it is in the household, um, you're supposed to take care of it. Uh, there should be only enough for the people who are there. Uh, if there's too much, then you join together with another household to be with the lamb, uh, to, to consume the lamb at the Passover. This lamb is to be without defect, a male, a year old, so a young male, uh, perfect and blameless. Um, take care of it until the 14th day of the month, so from the 10th day to the 14th day. You're supposed to take care of it, then slaughter it at twilight, so in the evening, so when it ceases to be the 14th day, uh, that is uh, when, when you're supposed to and slaughter it, so it must be on the 14th, but um, transition is in the next day. So, um, uh, then you are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of your door frames of the house where, they, where you eat the lambs. So you consume the lamb in the household, which is covered with the lamb's blood. Uh, that uh, Because it was also practiced within the Israelite culture to uh, drain the blood from an animal before consuming the animal because there was a commandment given at the time of Noah, so this is Genesis chapter 9, you are not to consume the blood, for life is in the blood and the, blo uh, and the life belongs to God. All life belongs to God, so uh, no consumption of blood by the people of Israel. So the blood of the lamb is a, that you have drained out of it and you place upon the door tops, the, the door frames and and, and posts. Uh, you are to consume the lamb, preparing it with bitter herbs, with bread made without yeast, uh, and it is to be roasted over a fire, whole, so, so you do not cut this into parts and, and cook it in a pot or anything like that, you roast the whole thing whole. Uh, do not leave any part of it until morning, so you're supposed to consume the entire animal. Um, and this is also why you join together with other households. So if it's too much meat for you, then you join together with other households so you can share this. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. So uh, do not leave any leftovers. You are to burn the leftovers. And you are also supposed to eat it, as the Lord says in haste, so you're supposed to have uh, you're supposed to be fully dressed. Make sure that you're able to leave once the meal is done. So as soon as you consume the meal, then you can go out and, and go into the world. So, there are actually a couple different connections here with the New Testament. Because even though the Lord prescribes the Passover for the people of Israel so that this is part of the meal where they can um, understand that God has save them at this time. And I'll be going through that in the next in the next reading a little bit in, in more detail than I will now. But it's also pointing forward to something in the New Testament. So when you have the lamb, you have something that is normally set aside for sacrifice. So normally in the sacrifice you would take this a young animal that is a complete, whole, perfect, and you were to slaughter the best this best lamb and sacrifice it on the altar to God. And usually this is a whole burnt offering, uh, if it's a sin offering. So as a whole burnt offering, you're roasting the entire animal. 
you also you drain out the blood first, but uh, you roast, you you uh, burn the entire animal uh, on the altar. So we recognize that this is a sin offering, but usually a sin offering, if you are offering it to God, you are burning it entirely, so it's completely consumed by fire, completely given to God, or uh, it is um, only uh, partially <laughs> partially burned, and then it is distributed to the tribe of Levi uh, to be consumed. So it is offered to God, the sin offering is complete, and then whatever meat is left behind, that is what uh, the tribe of Levi lives on, because they are the ones who are the, the priests. We'll be getting into the Levitical laws, among other things, in, in the book of Leviticus, of course. Uh, with this sacrifice, uh, when, when God is saying that you are to consume it and then burn the rest, He's saying that this sacrifice, normally given entirely to God, is also given to you, God's people. So when uh, you are consuming the animal, you are consuming the entirety of the animal as normally would be offered in the sacrifice on the altar. Uh, when, if anything is left over in, until morning, which should not happen, uh, if anything is left over, uh, you are to burn it. So you are not to mm -mm, leave an offering unoffered, you are supposed to burn the rest of it. So this offering is similar to a sin offering where you are, uh, uh, instead of offering it directly to God through by burning it entirely, you are consuming it entirely. Uh, the other small aspect of this uh, with the blood. The blood is also something that would uh, normally be sprinkled among various people, uh, depending on what type of sin offering this is. Uh, you Sometimes the blood is sprinkled on the people, on the priests, uh, depending on what type of offering it is. Again, these things are outlined in Leviticus, so there's a few different ways that this can go about. But uh, normally when you were sprinkling the people or sprinkling, and the priest is sprinkling himself, he's, he actually would sprinkle himself before the people. Um, uh, the, the blood, the lifeblood that is being, that is present there, uh, basically it is being applied to the people because life is in the blood. So it's recognized that God, instead of God demanding the blood from the people, that the blood that, or, or the life that is demanded of the people for breaking God's law is taken from this lamb instead of the people. So it is the lamb who dies, or the, whatever animal it may be. The animal who dies instead of the people. So th this is a sacrificial animal, which saves the lives of the people, which... Uh, has a central part in the offering of sacrifice to God so that the people might be forgiven their sins and that what is normally offered to God is now shared among the people with God's blessing. Um, with this particular sacrifice in, in the Passover though, instead of sprinkling the people, it is sprinkled over the doorposts. So instead of the people having this lifeblood applied to them, it is now defining their their homes and their worship areas. So when you put it on the, the doors and posts, it is so that uh, the the angel of death in the land of Egypt for the for the tenth plague, it will see the blood, see that a life has already been sacrificed for the people, and not uh, come in and take life from the people. So when we have the blood here offered uh, or, or displayed for God. It is uh, basically a sign that blood has already been shed for these people. They are partaking of the animal from which this came. So the, the animal is giving these people life, and there is no evil presence that can enter into nor No evil spiritual being that could enter into their presence. Uh, no evil at all, really, because uh, sin would be left at the door. Hmm. Now, this is also why... Uh, the lamb is offered with bitter herbs, also with bread without yeast. So the bitter herbs is a reminder of the bitterness of the situation. As this is, uh, this, this is a sacrifice, uh, they are in trouble, they are in a land where they are persecuted and afflicted. So this is a bitter situation. So they're t partaking of some of the bitterness of what happened here in the feast. And there's also the bread offered without yeast. Yeast is a symbol of of sin, so little yeast leavens the entire lump, uh, loaf of bread. So you're supposed to eat bread without yeast, recognizing that um, 
If you are pure, you are not being puffed up or, or built up in sin, but you are remaining uh, who you should be. But another... Oh... No, no, I'll leave that for a moment. Okay. Um, the people are also eating this in haste because they're recognizing that this is the final meal before they have to go out and enter into the land of promise. Because of what happens on this night of the Passover in Egypt, where the Lord passes over the people, passes over their sins, does not uh, call them to account for their sins, but passes over these sins, and calls them, uh, and actually goes into la the, the Egyptian households, who are not partaking of this divine meal, uh, when they are consumed in the angel of death's plague, they will then uh, allow the Israelites to leave their land, uh, driving them out because of the death that has befallen the people of Egypt, and allow them to go into paradise, so in, into the promised land which God has promised the people. Of course, there's many different stops along the way, but we'll come across those as we go to them. The idea is that the people are in haste, they are leaving the land of sin, they are leaving in evil, and then going off into the promised land. So, the Passover, <laughs> the actual feast itself, uh, rather than some of the other symbolism. So the feast itself uh, comes into the New Testament in a couple different ways. Now, both of them are tied to the life of Christ, of course. One of them is the, the Last Supper of Jesus Christ, which is held on the Passover night. And then the other one is Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And I'm not entirely sure if I can treat them both separately as I go through the text, so I'm just going to treat them both together and reference them both together. So as we go through the text, looking at what's going on with the community, with the, with the Lamb, and the people in the household. So, so tell the whole, this is uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, uh, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is, uh, this is the uh, identity that John the Baptist ascribes to Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. And this also comes up quite succinctly within the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 5, and, and then continuing on from there within the book of Revelation. So Jesus Christ is recognized as a lamb, a lamb perfect for the slaughter. Uh, this is also prophesied in Isaiah 52, thir verse 13, to uh, 53, verse 12, which is the suffering servant uh, song in Isaiah, where... Uh, Basically, there was a, he was being led like a lamb to the slaughter. The Savior is being led like a lamb to the slaughter. So the lamb comes into the presence of his household. Who's the household? Jerusalem. When does the lamb come in? On the tenth day of the month. When is that? Palm Sunday. So Jesus Christ rides into Jerusalem on a colt, on the foal of a donkey, on the tenth day of the month in which the Passover happens. And then he dwells among people for a number of days until the fourteenth day of that month when he will be slaughtered. So the fourteenth day is the Passover feast. Uh, this is where Jesus has the Last Supper, and, this is, uh, and, and when he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, then he is taken into... Um, into the possession of the people so that he might be slaughtered, so they condemn him there. So, <clears throat> so if a household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor. So all people uh, who need forgiveness, and forgiveness beyond the blood of beasts, which comes to an end, you need to be, have repeated sacrifices of beasts in order to be cleansed of your sin, as per Old Testament law, but with Christ as the perfect sacrifice, uh, he is perfect for all. So every time you're coming into the... So uh, when Jesus Christ entered into the presence of the people of Israel to be slaughtered, all people everywhere join in his sacrifice. So all people are uh, with Christ in this. So the entire household is now uh, all people everywhere for all time because Jesus Christ is sufficient uh, food for all people. Um, so Exodus chapter 12 verse 5. 
Now, the animals you choose must be a year, must be year old males without defect, and you must take from the sheep or the goat. So Jesus Christ identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is being led like a lamb to a slaughter or, uh, in in uh, in Jerusalem in the last week, Passion Week, you could call it, uh, Holy Week, you could call it. He is without defect, perfect and blameless. Um, not that we're looking towards the physical stature of Jesus Christ, we're looking to him as one who is perfect in his flesh, one who has done every good thing, one who is perfect according to God's law that he may be a perfect sacrifice for us. So, uh, yes, it says, so in verse 6, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Um, when Jesus Christ is going to the crucifixion, uh, when Pilate says that he washes his hands and says, I am washed of this man's blood, the people, the crowd around him say, let his, be, let his blood be upon our heads and the heads of our children. So when Jesus Christ is going to the cross and the, and the community of Israel is slaughtering Christ on the cross, it is the entire community of Israel which is seen as those who are perpetrating the deed. Uh, not that we are saying that Jews are evil, it is that uh, the responsibility for the death of Christ is upon the people. So we who are also being joined into the community of Israel, being joined into the household of Israel as we come into the church and being joined uh, to all the faithful believers so that we might become the church of God. All of us recognize our guilt for putting Jesus Christ on that cross. It was our sins which nailed Jesus to the cross, our sins which demanded his blood for our forgiveness. So it is we who have also slaughtered Jesus Christ. We participate in this sacrifice because we, have been, we are the ones who are responsible for our sins, which uh, placed Jesus upon the cross. So if there, is, if there was just one sinner in the entire universe, even if you were just the one sinner in the entire universe, Jesus Christ would have still went to the cross for your sins so that he would offer his sacrifice his sacrifice, his own body and blood for you so that uh, you would be forgiven. So if there was only one sinner that ever lived, then Jesus would have still gone to the cross, would have still offered himself for you so that by his blood you would be saved. So his blood would be upon your head and his blood upon your head is not what condemns you but, what, but that which forgives you because you are receiving it in faith as one who recognizes Jesus Christ as Lord. The unbelieving community of, of, uh, of the Jews at the time of Jesus Christ, those who are, are demanding crucify him, crucify him, those who are outside of the faith, they do have the Christ's blood on their head, but this is, uh, but outside of faith and forgiveness because they have rejected faith and forgiveness in Jesus Christ our Lord, they are actually judged according to the blood. And that's important when, I, when we get to talking about communion. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Must slaughter, uh, must slaughter them at twilight. Jesus Christ was arrested in the night. Uh, the entire night he was in trials. He eventually went to the cross at noon and died at three. So it was not I mean, an immediate slaughter, but one that was very much drawn out, which is a slight difference with the, with the Passover feast here. So uh, verse Exodus 12, verse 7, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses, and they where they eat the lambs. So rather than um, using the blood of Jesus Christ to put on our frames and other things, uh, the blood of Christ is so precious to us that we recognize it as that which is given for us to partake in. So when Jesus Christ says at the Passover feast, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, eat and drink, we eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, not putting it upon our heads or upon our foreheads or even prancing it around in a procession. But we take it and eat it because this is what our Lord Jesus Christ has told us to do. We are not commanded to, uh, in, as in the Old Testament, uh, sprinkle it all over the place, but we are consuming it because this is what we are called to do. So, uh, that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. So the bitter herbs, recognizing bitterness as the situation of Israelites back in Egypt, corresponds with the bitterness we understand uh, uh, Jesus Christ to have been in. Jesus Christ going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane 
was in such a state that he was sorrowed unto death, basically. And that was how Jesus phrased it, was, uh, my soul is sorrowed unto death, um, or sorrowful unto death. And when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is anxious, he's praying to the Father to take the, the cup of wrath from him, the cup of wrath meant for us, uh, but since it would only befall us, God keeps it placed upon Jesus Christ so he drinks fully from the cup of God's wrath rather than have us uh, drink any drop from it. Also at the garden, Jesus is so sorrowful that he begins sweating blood, uh, so anxious that he is, his, body is, uh, his body is breaking down in some sense. So. so the bitterness we recognize is also the bitterness of having our Lord God, Jesus Christ, die upon the cross for our sins. So even though he is completely innocent, he is blameless, he is still broken in death for our sins. And this is what is so bitter about the situation. Uh, likewise, uh, the, the bread made without yeast, we're recognizing that as uh, not something that we necessarily um, symbolically <laughs> uh, place upon the cross, even though Jesus Christ said that he is the bread of life. So as the bread of life, he is the one who spiritually fulfills us, spiritually sustains us. So when we consume bread, we do recognize that we are consuming uh, the life of Jesus Christ given for us. But also when we are... Uh, <laughs> When we're also looking to communion, uh, the bread of life is given for us, that is the true flesh and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, um, verse 9, do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. So, we recognize that Jesus Christ did not burn upon the cross. We're also recognizing that Jesus Christ uh, has offered himself in Holy Communion for all of us. So all of us who are partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, all of us are partaking of the life of Christ and nothing needs to be burned or cleansed or purified by fire. So when Jesus Christ offers himself as a perfect sacrifice once for all, we are participating in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, being participants in the cross of Jesus and receiving the life Jesus uh, gives to us through this sacred meal. So when we are consuming the blood of Jesus, sorry, consuming the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we recognize that uh, Jesus has offered to us something holy and perfect, and specifically for us, for all of us to share together, leaving none of it uh, left. Because this is uh, the purpose for which Jesus gave his body to be, be to to be a perfect sacrifice for us. So. Um, Verse 11, this is how you are eat it, to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, with your sandals in your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. So eating it in haste is, has a little bit of a different meaning for us now. Because when we're uh, participating in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it's not that we're trying to escape sin and try to journey, uh, journey into a, a promised land here on earth. It is that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven our sins so that we might live in righteousness. So we must be prepared at the sacrificial meal to basically be called to account on Judgment Day. And when we are called to account, we are called to account and say that we have Jesus Christ forgiven us for all our sins. So on Judgment Day, you're completely whole and forgiven and you will enter into the Promised Land. But for now, when we participate in the sacrifice, we who are still on earth, we are those who are eating it in haste, going out into the world, proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ our Lord, but also recognizing that we are in a desert of a world, a desert of sin, as Israelites are about to go into. So before we leave this tainted flesh, tainted with, the, with sin, and go to meet our Lord, we recognize that we will uh, be journeying in haste, journeying in the forgiveness of our God, being journeying in his promises, and we'll receive those promises uh, on the last day when our, our flesh is raised from the dead, joined back to our spirit, and we live in the resurrection of our Lord. So, a couple of different things there. So, the sacrifice of Christ, also a little bit of the Passover, and I'll deal with communion a little bit more succinctly. So, when uh, Jesus is in the participating in the Last Supper, and he's saying that this is my body, you take and eat, this is my blood, take eat. Uh, first order with that. Uh, 
uh, he's actually giving to those in attendance his body and blood. So we are actually consuming the lamb. We are leaving none of it until morning. I mean, all of us are participating together and eating it. So in a very practical way, that's why we try to limit the amounts of food that we have here offered at the altar, where we're trying to recognize that it is something holy and precious given to us, and that <clears throat> we are not to leave any of it behind. The entirety of what is offered in, in to us at the altar is to be consumed. So if we are to dispose of any of the elements, you're to do so in a very reverential way. So recognizing uh, what what happened with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We are to return it to the earth as, as one, one given to burial. Um, Roman Catholics, they typically use this verse here in Exodus to say that we should burn anything that's left behind. But uh, the, proper, the proper way to actually do this is to consume all elements. The proper way to do this, is, the most proper way to do this is co to consume all elements. Uh, there is a practice to leave elements um, for the next week to be consumed. But this is not the best practice. The best practice would be to uh, bury it, putting it into the ground, uh, to burn it, or to, and best of all is to consume it, because that is what we are called to do in the meal. So, You can, kind of, you can see that uh, through this, through the participation of the Passover meal, how it points forward to the person of Jesus Christ, now we participating in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we receive all these things. This is a meal given for us so that we might have forgiveness. As I was saying when I was describing this meal, especially within the Old Testament context, I was saying that this was a sacrificial meal, uh, similar to sacrifices altered on altars, offered on altars, I mean, in the Old Testament, which are supposed to be for sins. So Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, giving himself entirely for us, also giving himself to us in uh, a holy communion for us to eat and to drink, he is offering himself as a sin offering for us, so in him uh, we have forgiveness of sins. So his offering is for a sin offering. By his blood, we are forgiven, as the blood is put on the doorpost in the Passover meal. And that is for, uh, so that no evil will enter in and, and, and no punishment be claimed of the people. So we who have Jesus Christ, his blood placed upon us, uh, both in a very spiritual sense, given by the Holy Spirit uh, through the word and sacraments, uh, we also have his blood placed within us in the blood of, of the Holy Communion, so that we who are strengthened by the blood and blood of our Lord in Holy Communion, we are not demanded, we do not have our sins demanded of us, but are completely forgiven within this meal. Participating within this meal, normally, uh, normally these things in the Old Testament would be whole burnt offerings, so the entire offering would be burnt and, and given to God, but we participating in consuming the meal, the sacrificial meal, we have um, we have been given a grace by God so that we participate directly with the forgiveness of sins as we consume directly the body and blood of our Lord in Holy Communion. So all of these things, all of these things, uh, the Passover, her communion, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all this points towards uh, God's forgiveness of his people and his love for us. Amen. Uh, we continue with the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on the back of our hymn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and praise to you for offering yourself to us upon the cross, so that we might be forgiven by your holy and precious sacrifice offered to offered between us and our Heavenly Father. Peace, Lord, draw us into participation in this sacrifice that we might have your body and blood given to us. Please forgive us by your holy and perfect sacrifice that we may stand perfect and blameless as you were perfect and blameless on the cross, that we may enjoy paradise with you forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you offer to us your body and blood in Holy Communion. Please, Lord, be with all those who are able to participate in Holy Communion, that uh, you guide their hearts to receive the sacrament worthily, that you uh, show them the forgiveness and love that you give to us through this sacred meal, and that those of us who might be fasting from this meal due to whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, that they be strengthened by your word and be pointed to your sacrament so that when they may receive it, they receive it in all joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, to write its continuance, and bless its end that our doings may be preserved from sin, our lives sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day from sin and every evil, and all my doings in life may please you. Turn to your hands and commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Your holy angel be with you, that the evil foe may have no power over you. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.